My guest today is Rick Hepworth. Rick, how are you doing? I'm really good. Thanks, David. Thanks very much for inviting me on the show. It's a pleasure to talk to you and, and, and finally meet. Uh, definitely. And uh, I really appreciate your time because I understand it's already the weekend. In it Leeds, is. It is the... Absolutely. There's a bottle of scotch with my name on it just waiting <laughs> when we finish. It's probably fresher than the scotch we get here in Chicago. <laughs> uh, what do you do, Rick, for a living? Uh, so in, in, in my day job, I, I work for a company called, called Black Marble, and we're a, we're a custom dev shop, basically. You dream it, we'll write it. And, and my life is spent as a, as a cloud consultant, really talking architecture, talking governance, helping my customers adopt cloud technologies, migrate their existing apps into the cloud. Um, and then on the side, well, you know, I'll do a bit of community now and again. So I, I sort of speak at conferences. I um I'm one of the organizers of a couple of community events here in the UK called DDD. Um, and I try and sort of support user groups and that kind of thing as, as much as I can. So I'm, I'm a bit of a split personality between I do I do do technology for my job, right? And I do technology for my passion. Uh, excellent. Uh, me too. In fact, I, I love what I love about technology is I do a lot of cloud computing, a lot of Azure. I love playing with toys and I love writing code and getting stuff out into production. And we were talking earlier, that's not all that there is to cloud computing and to software development. There's other parts of it that sometimes is less fun, but really, really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and, and don't get me wrong, I, I love to do that sort of develop, design, deploy, operate as well. But so today we, we said we talk about governance, right? And and the, the, the thing that I see so often when I'm working with customers is they call me in because they've got a project that's gone awry. And it hasn't gone awry because the tech team didn't know what they were doing. It hasn't gone awry because they've built something that doesn't work. It's gone awry because there was a disconnect between the needs of the business and the technical solution and the constraints of the business and the operation of the technical solution. So it could be something like, hey, you put that in the cloud, it suddenly cost us a fortune this month. We weren't expecting that. That's totally blown the budget. And now what are we going to do? Or it could be, well, that's a beautiful solution, but um, it, 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 it's, it's deployed in central US. That's great. All our customers in Europe, we can't move our data to the US. How are we going to do that? Or it could be something like, well, um, hang on, you've picked a service there that isn't actually released yet. Where's the SLA? You know, the customers that we're working with don't support that. And all of those are solved not by beautiful code, not by DevOps practices and, you know, cross-functional teams. They're, they're solved by having a set of ground rules. And it's it's that one word that's designed to strike fear into the heart of every techie, right? Governance. Governance. And you said that twice already. What would define governance? So, I, I said I said ground rules, right? I mean, in its heavyweight form, governance is is the book that we use to to decide how we operate the cloud, right? It's it's the rules we live by. It's where can we put data? It's what technologies are we going to use? That kind of thing. And I think the reason people shy away from it is because they think. It's this heavyweight, huge, you know, 500 page slam it on the desk. Here are the rules, the rules to live by. And it, it isn't necessarily. It can be really lightweight. It can be it can be a framework that when you start isn't fully formed. But what it needs to do is identify those areas that your business is concerned with. So you can then apply those concerns to how you work in the cloud. So I mentioned a couple already, right? So let's say we're in a regulated industry. And I mean, David, you're in the US. If you were doing maybe healthcare in the US, perhaps you couldn't take your healthcare patient data and put it anywhere but in America. Yeah, there might be some That's privacy constraint. reasons or legal reasons for that. Absolutely. It's a really simple constraint. We need to know about it and we need to make sure that we can prove that we're complying with that. That doesn't need 500 pages. I've just articulated that in three sentences, right? Right. And Exactly the same when it comes to picking our technology. If if we've got a team, you said you used to be a C-sharp MVP, right? So we've got this team. We've got experts like you. 
they've they've been doing .NET for the past <clears throat> years, you know, because it's knocking <laughs> on a bit now, right? Um, and why then would we choose to move to the cloud and write our new application in Go? .NET devs, specialists, thing we've never done before. That's risky, right? You know, so the yep. technology governance might say, look, don't run off and use something new for the sake of it being new. How do we evaluate that technology and decide that it is actually going to give us value and it's not going to turn into this whacking great hammer that's going to hit us on the back of the neck when we can't debug it, deploy it, or, or understand how it works? And normally I find if I sort of couch it in those terms, the, the dev teams, the architects, the techies in the room grok that they understand it they understand that it's not trying to hold them back right it's it's it the best analogy actually was somebody i was talking to the other day it, it's the guardrails you put up at the temp in bowling alley right <laughs> i can't bowl to save my life but if you put those things up i can be guaranteed to hit the pins i can't knock them all down but at least i'm going to get there um think of it think of it like that Okay, so yeah, the the when you first presented, it sounds like it's maybe big design up front, which there's a big push against that these days. Yeah. But if it's just uh, you know guidelines up front, uh, general yeah. frameworks, yeah. Um, then people will accept that. That seems more agile, I, I guess. Is, uh, exactly. In, in like. the same way as within the technical realm, right? We've got an architect, we've got specialists who are in in certain areas. We need to draw in the business and find the person in the business who knows about our compliance requirements, how we can handle data, who knows about budgets, who knows about you know what is the business trying to achieve from our move to the cloud, so we can ask them questions every now and again, and they can help develop that rule set as the project goes on. And sure, if we're an enterprise, we might need more heavyweight governance. We might establish a cloud center of excellence, and we might have set practices, but all of that has to start somewhere, right? And it evolves over time. And the, the key thing then really is, how do you know where to start? And can you get advice? And, and can you go somewhere to learn about it? And are there places to discover what is good practice with governance, right? Yeah. Now is, it, is governance really all about just at the start of the project? Or is it an ongoing thing throughout a project? Completely an ongoing thing. Because it, it, it doesn't just govern how we choose what, what Lego bricks we're going to use to build our beautiful solution, right? It, it covers how we operate it. How do we manage our customers' data moving forward? Um, it covers things like our disaster recovery. It covers our business continuity planning. And you know all of those fold in. In the olden days, it used to be really easy, right? Because let's face it, I'd got a six foot rack in a room that I could reach out and I could touch. And if somebody said, where's the data? I could go here. Right. And my backup that's, copy that's very was comforting. there. <laughs> yeah, now it's a lot more abstract. and and that means we need to sort of write down the plans and we need to talk about how we guarantee where our stuff sits and how we guarantee our uptime and what is the plan if something goes down um you know it, it doesn't having services down isn't a problem if the business is tolerant of that and if it isn't tolerant of that what's our plan and how fast do we have to operate all of that is governance um Okay, so we're covering a lot of different things here that we're, we're talking about uh, where our data is, which technology to use, what's our disaster recovery plan? Yep. Um, is, there a, is there a checklist? What, what other things do we need to, to think about when we're thinking about governance? So this is where people start talking about this mythical cloud operating model, right? Which is effectively the handbook for your business as to how you're going to run cloud. How are you going to purchase it? How are you going to manage it? Um, who is going to be responsible for monitoring and maintaining it? The good news is actually there is a place to go. There is a sort of checklist. Um, certainly for Azure, if we look at this from a, for a, from a, a, a Microsoft point of view through the, 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 the prism of, of um, Redmond, on the Microsoft documentation site, there is an entire section devoted to governance. And there are um, tools to help you implement. So there's something called the cloud adoption framework. And, and that helps you step through assessing where you are as an organization, looking at how mature you are as a, a user of technology to identify the areas that you're going to have to, to look at and, and gives you some sort of starter for 10, if you like, um, documentation, governance frameworks, that kind of thing. And there's also the, um, the well-architected framework. So we can look at our application and it'll take us through a series of, of, of questions 
where by answering that, we can identify, again, how mature we are, how good a job have we done of answering all of the questions around our app, around backup, DR, um, resilience, reliability, data management, risk, all of that kind of stuff. So the, the link to go to is um, aka.ms slash governance docs, if memory serves, which is a capital G and a capital D. And that drops you into the Azure Governance Center. And there's a wealth of information in there that if if you're new to this, um, it'll work you through, you know, it, from from zero to hero, if you like. It's not exactly <laughs> parish in a month of lunches, but, you know, you, you can wade through that. And the key thing really is, is, is not to be afraid and, you know, don't think that as a as a developer this isn't for you. You know, I I try and encourage the technical teams that I work with to seize the initiative if their organization hasn't put governance in place, because it's a great way of building those bridges, right? Between the technology and the non-technology management and organizational you know, members and stakeholders. That if you're the dev going, I think we need some guardrails for this project and I've I've found these things that will help us and hey I'd like these people from the business to come and and lead in this that's great for your career right and it's it's great for the business and everybody wins yeah and I just checked that AKAMS link and it is correct it takes me to uh, the Azure governments documentation I'll take a look at that later on and add that to the show notes um, it's not we have it works but you know <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, it worked today uh, we haven't talked about security. All I imagine that's a big part of this, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, that takes many forms, right? So first of all, one of the things I see going wrong in organizations is they think, ah, oh, well, security, important. We've got to lock everything down. And suddenly we're unable to develop. We can't work. We can't create the applications and solutions because we have no rights. And Part of the reason for that is organizations tend to start with one subscription for their, their cloud service, and they don't think of, of how a subscription can be a, a unit of demarcation, if you like, okay. that we can have a subscription for development that has much more loose regulation to allow the developers to do things. And maybe that flags alerts if they're doing something wrong, but it doesn't block them. And then we have our production subscriptions. And we probably don't even allow our developers to access the production subscriptions. Automated tooling is the thing that pushes our uh, solution out there. And then telemetry kicks in. And we, we talk about things like least privilege. So I only have the rights to do what I need to do. And we also talk about things like um, just-in-time administration which I think is really cool. It basically says, hey, so, okay, David's one of our administrators, so if, if something breaks, you know, you can climb in and you can have a look at it, except you can't. You're allowed to, but in order to get the rights given to you, there's a little workflow. So you click a button to request the elevation, and then um, an audited workflow that a manager says, yes, that's absolutely fine, grants you the rights that you need to, to do that investigation, but it might even be time limited. So you might have a couple of hours of elevated privileges and then we take it off you again. And again, all of that is audited. And that's not because I want to restrict what you can do. It's that I I want to give this to you as a safety blanket that you can say, well, no, it can't have been me because I don't have rights to go and break anything unless I request them. And not only in terms of security, in terms of permissions and, and, and rights to how we manage our estate, right? Governance and security is how we tackle security throughout our, our, our um, application. So it should be talking about things like encryption of data, encryption at rest, you know, how we're moving things around, how are we doing authentication. Now, please, God, don't roll your own authentication provider. You know, that's a solved problem. I don't care whether it's Auth0 or Azure AD or what it is, go and get something that's pre-written because there's risk associated with that. Um, right. And, and, and then there's the, there might be security. Well, depending on what application we're, we're writing and, and um, our organization, governance also covers how we're managing devices, right? So that smartphone you've got in your pocket, if you want to run my business applications on it, I might need you to, to create a secure enclave on that device using something like Intune or, or one of the, the other mobile device um, solutions. All of that folds into that sort of big umbrella of cloud governance or can do if, if, if you're a large organization, you need it to. 
You mentioned uh, some of the documentation that's available. Are there any other tools that can help me to manage this governments? So there's an awful lot when we talk about Azure itself. There are services within Azure that will help you. So uh, we have things called management groups, which allow you to effectively draw out a structure, if you like, of your organization, and then you can plug subscriptions into those management groups. So we might do that by division, you know, I don't know, finance or HR, if we're running internal apps, we want to do chargeback, or we might do it by geography. And what we can then do is use those management groups as a tool. So the next thing we have is something called a blueprint. Um, don't confuse Azure Blueprints with Azure Blueprints. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, what now? Um, so Azure Blueprints originally were an incredibly useful thing, actually still tied into governance, right? So you, they had validated architectures and approaches. If you needed to do uh, a SOX compliant app or a UK official compliant app, you could go and look at the Azure Blueprints and see what they were. Yeah. Then we have this Azure service called Blueprints. Just to bend your head, you can use Azure Blueprints to start deploying your Azure Blueprints. And at that point, fire starts burning and my, my, my yeah, head explodes. Um, <laughs> we could have called it Link, but we've already named like five products Link. <laughs> exactly. It's like ACS, the single most <laughs> three-letter acronym in Azure, right? So what a Blueprint allows me to do is um, collect together a series of rules and things I want to do with a subscription. So. I can say this blueprint is going to apply a set of security rules and grant access to this subscription for these Azure AD groups. And I can say this blueprint is going to deploy using an ARM template certain things that I want to have in every subscription. So Key Vault, for example, secret management, which is another side of governance. Key Vault is a great way of storing our certs and our secrets so we can safely and securely access them for our applications. Mm -hmm. Every time I put a subscription, I can, if I want, stamp cookie cutter out a, a, a Key Vault into it using a blueprint. And then the final thing that I can do with a blueprint is deploy something called Azure Policies. And Azure Policies are discrete little rules and you write them in JSON, and you don't have to use Blueprints to deploy them either. Um, and I'll, I'll, there's more cool stuff about them. I'll, I'll care, talk about when I, I explain where I am. So we can write rules. like So you know I said um, you can't put your data outside central US, right? I can write a little JSON rule that basically says if a deployment is occurring in this subscription and the region is not central US, block the deployment. Mm. And on the dev subscription, what I might do is say, don't block, just alert. So I can go and put my arm around the developer and say, you do know that you put that in Europe and it shouldn't be there, but I haven't stopped them working. Right. So I can collect those policies together, put them in a blueprint, and then I can apply a blueprint at a management group level to the subscriptions that exist in that management group. Hmm. Now, a cool thing about that is when your jolly regulator arrives with his clipboard, with all of the rules that you've got to comply with, with whatever framework of regulation it is, you can say, right, well, your rule there, I've got a policy here that matches that rule. And you can see that I've got this blueprint that applies that policy. And I can show you all the subscriptions that it's applied to. And then I can look in the Azure portal and I can show you everywhere that isn't compliant or is compliant with that policy. So you can get a report of all of your assets all the way across Azure and which ones don't meet policy. And we can even start getting clever and say, well, if they don't meet the policy, remediate. You know, I, I can't fix the region one, but it's like if I haven't turned on encryption at rest in a SQL DB, turn on encryption at rest or something like that. Mm. Um, now, the cool thing about policies is even out the gate, if I do nothing else, Azure will give me guidance against best practice, and there's a bunch of starter for 10 baseline security policies I can turn on that will help me raise my game and flag those sort of common errors, if you like, that people who are new to the cloud make, like not turning on encryption at rest or you know, um, certain restrictions on things not being turned on. And there's a GitHub repo with um, sample policies and various other places, again, where I can go and I can draw on, on the experience of others and the experience of Microsoft to start pulling those sample policies in. And again, my blueprints, when I create a new one, it will say, 
um, do you want to use this blueprint to create a UK official or whatever? And there are policies that have been created that meet the rules in UK official and the blueprint will suck them in and scaffold them and then I can apply them. So it can be a it can be a very rapid journey from zero to enough to give me confidence. And then I can start tightening the screws as I've learned more about those sort of building blocks and, and, and toys, if you like. Oh, very cool. I'm actually looking at, I think that's the right one. This is uh, github.com slash Azure slash Azure dash policy. Is and that? I see not only a guide in here with a bunch of markdown documents, but a folder called samples, which has yeah. examples of uh, automation, compute, Cosmos DB, SQL, storage, all sorts of different policies related to services in Azure. I wasn't yeah. aware of this. Thank you for that. I mean, the, the, the stuff around virtual machines is pretty cool as well. So, it um, you know, it's... Uh, have have you have you got um, firewall rules open? Have you have you got things running on VM? And and basically the compliance center, you, you can look in the Azure portal and it, and it just gives you a complete guide. Well, seventy five percent of your resources are compliant, twenty five percent aren't. Here, click and I'll show you the list of the twenty five percent that aren't. Um, and and you can work your way through. It's incredibly useful because it, the trouble is the cloud's like that big, right? Oh, getting bigger. Yeah, uh, and. I mean, to sort of put that into context, as as an MVP, when when I I used to be in in Seattle, MVP summit's a three day event, right? So so I arrive for my first summit thinking three day event, this is going to be great, and then I'm looking at my agenda. I mean, well, I've got content on Thursday and Friday. Hang on, I've got content on Thursday and Friday till six o'clock at night, and literally as an Azure guy, we used to start at eight, we finish at six. Our MVP lead didn't give us lunch. It was like, right, dive outside, get a plate, come back. We've, we're using it. <laughs> and we still didn't see all the product teams. And that was five days full on, at which point you just go, I need a holiday. Um, but it really does sort of illustrate the breadth of, of, of the cloud and how you can't really, you can either be like I am, right, a generalist who's quite broad but a bit shallow, or you can be a specialist. It's almost impossible to be across the board broad and deep and i have the utmost respect for a few people that genuinely are that and i'm forever <laughs> in awe of them yeah uh i do when i was an mvp uh, seven eight years ago uh, but i used to sneak over to the azure team because they had the best content yeah they were yeah. they were pushing new things out early before microsoft as a company started pushing things out early it was uh, a yeah. much better than i'd see over on the other side Nothing wrong with the C sharp guys; they're great guys. But <laughs> it's one of those tricky things, really, isn't it? A language is written. I mean, that's that's a bit unfair because every year there's a really great session where where um, somebody, you know, Anders or whoever, is going, oh, and here are the things we're introducing. Yeah. But it's incremental change; it's little things these days. Whereas, oh, especially so the language is 20 years old now. So yeah, yeah. But at the start of .NET, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, Remember that the early days of the .NET framework was C Sharp and then VB, VB.NET. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was good speak. days. I wasn't an MVP then, but that was, those were fun days. Uh, yeah. We're just about out of time. What's, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I can't think of anything, but that's... that's well, let, let's talk about you. Are you... Um, I know these are crazy times. You're not probably not traveling like you used to, but you're still speaking, right? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean... Um, you're right. I, I really miss the, the traveling for conferences, but everybody's pivoted to, to online. So uh, literally just this week, I was I was doing sessions at the European SharePoint conference um, on Azure, I should say, um, talking about sort of integration and that kind of stuff. It It's really great how as a community we've managed to shift. Yeah. And the thing that I actually really like is the fact that now everything's online people have got an opportunity to participate in events that previously they never would. So I was at a user group the other week, which was hosted by a friend of mine in Romania, and it was attended by some Romanians, some, some folks from the UK that sort of followed me across. There were some people from the Netherlands who we sort of knew a bit. There were some people from the US. And because it's all online, there's that great opportunity. And people can speak at conferences now that previously they never would have dreamed of. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Don't you? That it's it sort of opened it up. I, that I just, is very cool. It wasn't hosted by my friend Mihai Tataran, was it? Uh, 
uh, no, it was the... I, so a guy called um, Alex Mang, who's a friend of mine oh, from. I know Alex well. Yeah. yeah, I used to go to the IT Camp conference in Cluj Napoca every year. And oh, okay. Of course, that's now virtual. So. <laughs> Yeah, I it's miss, one of the, for, I keep saying I need him to organise a conference in Romania I can attend because I've I've not been. I so I'm not wearing it. I usually wear a bow tie if I'm doing speaking at, at, at ah. events. And um, uh, it, it started. I did some stuff online in the UK, and the guy that I was presenting with, um, we we developed this shtick of of wearing bow ties and changing ties for each session. Ah. But my wife buys me a bow tie for the country I'm speaking in. Mm. So, you know, I, I can always turn up and, and, and wear the flag. And I love that. Oh, and I, this I was is, growing this collection. I'm, this oh, is the Romanian flag right here. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, we, did, we did not plan this at all. <laughs> See, if I thought, I'd have got my Romanian bow tie out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's that's the bit that I miss. I miss the yeah. seeing new countries and meeting new people. Absolutely. But it's great that we've still managed to do all of the, the events and presentations. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're still going to manage to run the community events that I'm involved with online as well it's just it's a lot harder sometimes for those community events to manage sponsors and things because mm. um you know you, you can't have a table in a corner that people can go and talk to it's how are we going to how are we going to give value for the sponsors and that's that's a lot easier if you're a big event like build or aspc i think to, to build, build a value prop yeah but then again your your expenses are lower because you don't have a hall to rent you don't have food to buy and that sort of thing yeah but i mean i think i've filled the car twice since march yeah <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, Rick, thank you so much for your time. I'll let you go and you enjoy your weekend and stay safe. Yeah, you too, David. It was a pleasure talking to you and thanks very much for having me on the show. Do you know, it's been absolutely cracking that this evening, through the power of technology, I've managed to do an interview and make a new friend who's completely the other side of the planet and I haven't left my chair.